Are we gone? We're good. <laughs> How's everybody doing this morning? Good. It has been a hot summer, hasn't it? My goodness, I am hot on a lot of days, and we don't have air conditioning. It's an ongoing debate between Joel and I, <laughs> but there are some days where I am just hot. So earlier this week, I think on Monday, it was a day that like feels like 42, and my kids came to me with a 500-piece puzzle. Mom, can we do this together? And I'm like, absolutely, because one, I get a sit while I'm doing this activity, and two, I'm sitting in front of a fan, which is also a big perk, and three, I am like being a good mom, right? Spending this quality time with the kids. And so a 500-piece puzzle in and of itself is, is a challenge. But then you add a two-, four-, and six-year-old, and you're just upping the challenge level. And so as I'm sorting pieces, they're becoming unsorted. And as I'm putting pieces together, they are becoming not together anymore. And it's just like a bit of chaos as we're gathered around the table building this 500-piece puzzle. But you know what I find the most frustrating out of it all? Is the box. When I'm building a puzzle, I like to have that box in front of me so I can see what I'm building. Well, the box is tipped over, it's upside down, it's backwards, it's nowhere near because Caleb's taken it for a walk two rooms over, and I am there with these 500 pieces and my wonderful children trying to build this puzzle. And I'm missing the box. I like to have that picture in front of me so I know what I'm working towards. And I feel like I share that mentality in life as well, that I long to have a picture before me so that I know these seasons that I go through, how they fit in this big picture. What is the purpose of this season or these days or hard times, good times? How does it all fit together? What is the big picture that I'm working towards in my life? Unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way. We don't always have a clear sense of what are we going towards. Today, we're going to spend some time looking at the temples um, through the stories in the Old Testament. So we're going to be flipping a little bit through the Old Testament. So we're going to start in 1 Kings chapter 8. So if you could find that, that would be helpful. And this is the story of the first temple that was built. And it was built under the leadership of Solomon. Now, Solomon was a very wise man, and he came from a great heritage. And so when it came time for him to build the temple, he had an abundance of resources available to him, both financial resources, labor. He had the best of the best working with him on this temple. And so... When it was done, about 13 years after it began, it was beautiful. It was gorgeous. It was absolutely well done. There's uh, no corners were cut except those who were cut by the painter. That's funny, right? <laughs> it was absolutely beautiful. Beautiful. And so they gather to dedicate this temple. And that's what's happening here in 1 Kings chapter 8. And we're going to start in at verse 10. Well, maybe a little bit before, around verse 6, sorry. And so they're gathered and they're kind of doing the ceremonial opening of this temple. And the priests then brought the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and put it beneath the wings of the cherubim. We're going to jump down now to verse 10. And when the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in a dark cloud, and I have indeed built a magnificent temple for you, a place for you to dwell forever. Wouldn't that be amazing to be there that day? That moment in our history when they're dedicating the temple and God's cloud comes in and fills the place. Wouldn't that be just astonishing to bear witness to that? And it's even so much so like the priest can't even continue with the ceremony. Like God just takes over. 
It would just be awesome to be able to be there. And that's just part of the ceremony of dedication. They end up sacrificing 22,000 bulls and 10,000 goats and sheep. And there's these prayers of dedication and worship and praise. And it's just an amazing moment where they dedicate this temple. And so if we carry on into verse 27 and to verse 30, and this is part of Solomon's prayer of dedication. And it's so interesting because Solomon has such a wise perspective of what is actually going on that day. And he says, but will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Yet give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy, Lord my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence this day. May your eyes be open towards this temple night and day. This place which you have said, my name shall be there, so that you will hear the prayer your servant prays towards this place. Hear the supplication of your servant and your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. Moses, or Solomon is saying, like, yes, this is an amazing temple. And yes, thank you that your cloud has come today. But we know, we know that it's not big enough to contain who you are. And that you are in the heavens, but we're pleading, Lord God Almighty, would you always have your ear bent towards this temple and your eye on this place, that as your people come to worship and come to pray, that you would hear us and be near to us. And Solomon says another very interesting thing in verse 38 that I just want to pause on, because he says, or verse 39, when you hear from heaven your dwelling place, Forgive and act. Deal with everyone according to all they do, since you know their hearts. For you alone know every human heart. So in light of this absolutely astonishing, amazing, totally top-notch temple, Solomon is saying it's all about the heart. He recognizes that about himself and about all of the Israelites, that the Lord is honored and glorified because they have built this temple according to what he's asked, but he is looking at the heart of each member of that community. And so the day continues, and the Lord appears to Solomon, and now we're in uh, chapter 9, and he makes a response back, and he says, starting in verse 4, As for you, if you walk faithfully before me with integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father when I said, You shall never fare, fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. So he too says, It is about your heart. And then he says, but, and as Pastor West likes to say, this is a big but, (laughs) but if you or your descendants turn away from me and do not observe the commands and the degrees I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them, and I will reject this temple I've consecrated for my name. Israel will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among the people. The temple will become a heap of rubble. And that's exactly what happens. Israel's heart turns from the Lord years from this day, and their heart becomes bent towards the idols of the land and the things that are not of the Lord. And what the Lord says here comes true Because eventually Babylonian comes and takes over Jerusalem and takes the Israelites into exile and the temple is destroyed. It's literally a heap of rubble by the time it's done. And so now these Israelites spend 70 years living away from their homeland, away from that temple, away from the place that God has called them to do. And they're living under the leadership of these Babylonians. And it's not how they would like life to be, I'm sure. Now, eventually, I'm no historian buff, so the facts are very scarce. But eventually, Persia takes over Babylonia, and they say to the exiles, you are welcome to go home. 
and they start sending the Israelites back to Jerusalem in waves. And so we're going to pick up the story now in Ezra. So we're going to flip to Ezra, and Ezra and Nehemiah are the books in the Bible that tell the story of those Israelites after living 70 years in captivity and their journey back to Jerusalem. So Ezra is paired with, and you're also going to need to find Haggai. Now, Haggai is a very small book in the Bible, and it is a prophet that the Lord uses during this time in history to speak to his people. And so we're actually going to start in Haggai. So you're going to need your fingers on Ezra and Haggai. So the Israelites have returned back, and they're rejoicing, right? We're back where we've come from. We're back to our homeland, our roots, and we're leaving behind that life we had in exile. And they start to reestablish life for themselves, right? They start to build homes, plant gardens. You know, I'm sure they did it all with such a great joy in their heart because they are no longer way over there. But the Lord is looking down on him And he uses Haggai to say this word of correction from Haggai 1, starting in verse 5. And this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have you full. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says says, give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expect much, but see it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with your own house. God is so gracious and so merciful in that moment because they were taken into captivity and taken away from their homeland because their hearts had turned from the Lord. And now by his grace and mercy, they're back. And are their hearts fully turned back to the Lord? And God is so gracious and he's like, hey, let me give you a tip. You got to get your hearts right The condition and the posture of your hearts need to be bent towards me. And what I'm asking of you in this season is to rebuild the temple. And the Israelites take that to heart. And they begin to rebuild the temple of the Lord. And so now we're going to look at Ezra chapter 3 verse 10. And so they rebuild the temple of the Lord. They start gathering resources. And we need to remember that they don't have the same deep pockets that Solomon did. They don't have the same wealth of resources, but they try their best. They're under the leadership of two young men and one who has a very difficult name. There's Joshua and then there's Zerubbabel or something like that. (laughs) And so these two young men are the leaders, and they're working hard to lead this generation of the Israelites into building the temple. And so eventually, they get the foundation laid. And Joshua and his buddy, with the hard name, are like, hey, let's celebrate. We've got the foundation made. We have heard the word of the Lord. We have turned our hearts back to him, and we've got a moment to to celebrate right? And so they gather, and they're all around the foundation, and this is what happens. Ezra 3 verse 10, and when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, their priests in their vestments and with the trumpets and the Levites with the cymbals took their place to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. And with praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, he is good, his love endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sounds of shouts of joy from the sounds of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard from far away. 
Can you imagine being those two young leaders? And they've gathered the Israelites. And all of a sudden, there's so much noise and nobody can tell who's crying and who's rejoicing because this older generation is just weeping because 70 years has passed. So there are people at this ceremony who were there when that first temple was being dedicated, who had walked into that first temple and had seen what's, what was created for the glory of the Lord. And they were there when that cloud moved in. And they were there when they sacrificed the 22,000 bulls. And they remember that. And now they're looking at this foundation and they just begin to weep. Because it doesn't compare to what once was. And maybe they're weeping for that simple fact, like this is just tiny. Or maybe they're weeping over the decisions they had made and the conditions of their hearts all those years ago, or weeping over the years that were lost while they lived in exile. But they were just weeping. And so Haggai has some words to say. So in Haggai 2, in, uh, we're going to start in verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to this guy with the hard name and to Joshua, the high priest, and to the remnant of people, and ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? And how does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, declares the Lord. Be strong. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what was covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Man, what a word from the Lord. For those people whose faces are stained with tears to hear God say, Don't worry. I got this. I have that puzzle box. I know the full picture. And I'm asking you to trust me. And in this season, I'm asking you to work on rebuilding the temple. And don't worry that it's smaller. Don't worry that it's different than what what once was. Because my spirit remains in you and with you. So work. Just go for it. And what a moment, right? And I can just see in my mind's eye that older generation lifting their faces and they have a choice. They have a choice to believe that that word that Haggai told them is true. Or they have a choice to just live in the past and not dedicate their lives to this new temple. As I read this story, I feel like it's so applicable to our own lives. That God's glory and his presence is here with us today. That God is with us and he's saying, don't worry, don't fear. I am with you and work. And work at what, we may say, And that's where that condition and posture of our heart is so important. Because as our heart is in a condition that it's bent towards the Lord, then the Lord can speak to it and call us to tasks day by day or season by season or even big life things. Because as we know what God is calling us to, we can walk forward in faith. And even though we might not see the full picture, our hearts know who's holding that full picture and we can trust him completely and we can go for it. 
But it takes boldness and fearlessness to move forward in what God calls us into because it's not easy to volunteer for the children's moment and put yourself up there in front of all these people and and get down on your knees with the kids. I just love it seeing my friend Andrea up here because I know it's not easy. But she leaves fear in the pew and she comes up here and God's glory is greater in her life and through her life. And that's just one example of what I see in this congregation. And God's glory desires to be greater tomorrow and the next day, but it takes the condition and the posture of our hearts for God to be able to speak and to lead us. Earlier this month, our family spent a week down in Penn Yan, New York, and the intention of the week was for the mornings for Joel and I to study under the leadership of a man named Penn Clark. And uh, the week was different than we had anticipated, but it was still good. And there was this moment in worship and prayer that it was like God gave me a glimpse of that box, but his words were something like, Petra, these are some of the giftings that I have in you. Pursue them, work towards them, because my glory wants to be greater in your life. And then the next breath, it's like, and these are some of the giftings that your marriage has. Pursue them and work towards them because my glory wants to be greater in and through your marriage. And that is like, I have no idea what that big picture is. It's like Caleb took it to the three rooms over, right? But you trust who's leading you and you can put pieces together or start a little section over here and a little section over here and eventually, Lord willing, we will see the full picture of what we're working as in our individual lives, but also as a collective group of people who love the Lord. I don't think we ever get to retire from being the living temple of God. I don't think we ever get to say, well, God's reached top-notch glory in my life, and I'm out, (laughs) right? God always desires a greater glory in and through our life, and it's in those small things like that song that Matt sang. It doesn't have to be big things that God's glory can just boom out of who you are. But it's in those small things that can change the world because as God's glory is bigger in and through us, the world is changed. What a story. What a history to look back on and to learn from. But the message that God gives there in Haggai is just so true. Do not fear, says the Lord, for I am with you. My spirit remains with you and work because I deeply desire for my glory to be greater in your life than it has been before. I've asked Matt to lead us in the song, Take My Life and Let It Be. And I love the lyrics of this hymn because I think it's a great opportunity for one, for us to really consider what is the condition and the posture of my heart? Am I working towards a picture that is a picture that I have created and I am working towards? maybe similar to what the Israelites were corrected in in Haggai 1? Am I holding that picture before myself and that's what I'm pursuing? Or is the condition of my heart one in which I am trusting my Lord even though I don't necessarily see the big picture? And the second thing with this hymn is we literally get to sing out, Lord, take my life and let it be. Take my mouth and let it be. Take my feet, my hands, tomorrow, the rest of the today, and it's for your glory, Lord. And so I just encourage me and you that as we enter into this song of worship to truly consider what is the condition of my heart and what is it that God is calling you into and just let him, let him use you.
Let him take your life and let it be, even though we may not have that final picture. So I'm going to pray, and Matt, maybe you can come up. Um, Jesus, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you that you are full of grace and full of mercy. And God, we thank you that you love us. And Jesus, we just ask that as we enter into this song, that you would be near to us, Lord, that you'd be speaking to our hearts. And God, with your your gentle touch, may we truly believe and truly say, take our lives. It's all for your glory. In your mighty name. Amen.